All right. Well, I welcome you all to this webinar as we persist in digging deeper into slavery and the what happens because of it in our generations. So, Father God, I come before you and I ask for wisdom and revelation, knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Father, we have desperate need of you to understand so that we can see it as you see it. I step into Jesus, the rabbi, the teacher. I ask that the teacher be magnified through me, that you teach Jesus, that you give me the grace to teach, that you give everyone who's listening the grace to hear. I thank you for that, Father. I praise you and I bless you and I honor you because you are the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and you are created. You created us and you are the creator. So thank you, Father. Bless you, bless you, bless you. This week has been an interesting week for me. I had ideas on how it would go and it has not been going in that direction at all. And as Valerie and I have been discussing what we're, as we delve deeper and deeper into the layers, this is all layers. As we delve deeper, it was like, we're not ready for a court case. We will not be ready on the 6th of December. We have so much more that needs to be brought in, so much more understanding. So for all of you who are a part of this group, I recommend you go back and you listen to the Verdicts of Hell. You listen to the bruised heart of the family, that you listen to the um, I, I just lost the rest of them. If you were part of the intensive training in the Mercy Court, go back and listen about the cause of curse. There's so much so many pieces that are being drawn together into this teaching. So we're going to begin today, and I'm going to begin with what the Lord this morning is. I asked the Lord, what scripture is the foundational scripture for this particular teaching? And what I heard in my spirit was, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And I said, well, I understand what that means, I think, but I've learned a long time ago that scripture is not as we have perceived it. And so I always go in and really dig into the Hebrew and the Greek. It's just part of who I am. And so I, the first word I looked at was no, and no there means comprehend. And comprehend is a very interesting word because when we say comprehend, we typically will define it is to understand, but we say, what is the definition of understand? We say to comprehend, it's circular reasoning, and we really don't know what the definition is. So if you go into comprehend, prehend comes from the, from the Greek, which means to grasp something. Now, you can't grasp something unless you have light. Light is the important denominator in any kind of gaining knowledge and understanding. So if you walk into a dark room and there's no light in the room and there's something you need to get off the table, you won't be able to do it unless light comes into that room. Otherwise, you're going to go and you're going to be tripping around and knocking things off the table. You can't, only with light can you go and grasp it, seize it, take possession of it. So it says, and you'll know the truth. So it means you're going to comprehend the truth. You're going to grasp it. You're going to seize it. You're going to perceive it. You're going to apprehend. Now, truth in the ancient Greek was synonymous with reality as opposed to illusion. Anything outside of the reality of God and his law and his history is illusion. So it's grasping the truth, the truth of the reality, the divine reality, the divine truth that has been, re has been revealed to man. So. And the truth, this truth of what God is showing us, it's what's going to set us free. Now, to set free means to make free, 
to exempt from liability. It is a legal term. Release from bondage, to liberate, and it's to exempt from all moral, ceremonial, ceremonial and mortal liability. So if we put this together with all the concepts that are in this simple sentence that we have known, for those of us who've been in the church for decades, what it's saying is you will know, and it's basically saying to my disciples, if you keep my commandments, if you stay in my word. So the word is critical to being disciples. That's a dis disciplined one who is following him. <coughs> You will know, you will apprehend, you will comprehend the truth, the true reality, not the illusion of culture. And this true reality that comes from God and knowing God and seeing from God's perspective, is that's what's going to set us free. That's what's going to liberate us from the liability. Now, liability is from those charges, when you have a liability against them, you are responsible to pay whatever the price is. And before Jesus Christ, the price against our heads was death. So, I want to get into the next thing I was talking to the Lord about is the whole idea of the basic verdicts of hell we're looking at. Now, we have so much work to do on this, and I really, really do appreciate your prayers because we're not going to do it without your prayers and your prayer support because we're walking into some areas that we have not looked at before. When we were in Nagaland, we experienced the generational core beliefs that were limiting the Nagas. The Nagas, Nagas are a tribal people, and they were headhunters right up to the 18th, 19th, probably into the 20th century. They were headhunters. But then God, in his rich mercy, he sent revival to Naga land. And the Nagas, because they were tribal, they were considered by the Hindis, and they're a state of India. They were considered less than dogs. They were beneath the untouchables. And because this was the core belief of the India, of the Indian army, they went into a period of almost 60 years of genocide and her horrific destruction of their villages, their way of life, their women were brutally, brutally raped by whole platoons of men because they were dogs, they were less than dogs. Now, that generational core belief of the Hindi set in motion the destruction of a people group. And when we were there last year, and we were looking at generational core beliefs, we realized one of the most important core beliefs about against the Nagas was they were savages. And on the basis of savages, and savages is basically, you know, they're not like us. We are educated. We uh, have this long culture. Think of India. India's culture goes back thousands and thousands of years with these amazing structures that they built. With their, um, all of their books. All of their books. And so they've got this whole rich history. Now you contract, contrast the rich history of India versus the tribal primitive ways of the Naga people. They lived in villages, they used spears. Their wealth was determined by how many of their enemy heads they had hanging from their, from their huts in the village. So they, the, the Indians, the Hindi, the Indian government felt totally justified in eradicating the, and doing genocide against the Nagas. Now, what was the outcome? What was the fruit that we saw in Nagaland because of this? One fruit we saw was the people hid. They did not want to be seen. 
They do not want to be noticed. This is very similar to what I've experienced from Mexicans when I was teaching. Then they had the, they, the men, when their culture was destroyed, now the men had been hunters. And of course, all of the Western attitudes about hunting came into India and they did not allow them to hunt any longer. So the men who had been hunters had nothing to do. So we found them throughout the nation, they would be laying about drinking beer, doing drugs, while the women were engaged in all of the care of the family. They went out and they worked, they took care of the home, they took care of the children, they were the ones doing the farming, because in their culture, the men were the hunters, and the women took care of the land, and they took care of the children. So they both had roles, but the role was destroyed with the destruction of culture, with the destruction of a way of life. And we recognized as we were in Nagaland that that same destruction has happened to tribal people all over the world. The same kind of attitudes, the same beliefs, the same verdict of hell that is against them. Because as we're doing this process, we're not doing it just for blacks in America. That would be selfish. We are doing it for the tribal people that have been enslaved in the world. So what are some of the basic verdicts of hell that I've been looking at? Now, a verdict of hell, I'm going to go through a short teaching in a little bit. Basically, it is what did the government of hell make a judgment, make a law, establish a law that affects the people? So. In, in terms of blacks from Africa, and realize there are blacks in southern India, skin tone is very, very important in those cultures. There, they basically, there was because of the enlightenment, which was the rejection of God and his word, the rejection of the miraculous, men began to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what was the main lie that man believed when Satan in the garden tempted Eve? He basically, if you eat of this fruit, you will be as God. So man is continually wanting to be as God. And it's that belief that judgment of hell, that's one of the first verdicts of hell that is an operation of all of this, is certain people groups truly believe they are as God. So with that, being God, they determined that other people, such as the blacks from Africa, they're a totally different species. In fact, they're the missing link in evolution. So because they're a different species, we can treat them differently. They do not have the same feelings. Out of that comes all of the horror of slavery because they're a different species. And they're savages. Savages, the verdict of savage is huge because if someone is a savage, they do not have the sophistication, the civilization, the knowledge, the culture. Their culture is despised. Out of all of that, they're inferior. That's just a fruit of all of this. But the basic message, the basic verdict of hell, is blacks, savages, and we're going to put it at savages, the tribal people are not included in the truth that all men are created equal because there's different species of men. And our definition of men in that particular saying does not include them. And they're not created in the image and likeness of God. That is the bottom line. And whatever culture is the superior culture because of civilization, because of their knowledge, that is the culture that has the right to enslave the other tribal people. So, 
a gen this becomes generational core beliefs. Generational core beliefs impact perception and form our attitudes. They form the reality. Remember, the truth, the truth shall set you free. The knowing the truth, knowing that reality of God, God's reality, and not the perception and reality that has been established by mankind without God. Now, it's interesting, when God created man in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 127, this is, this, is, this is a revelation that just keeps on reverberating in me. God created man in his own image. An image is a likeness, it's a resemblance to the nature and character of God as creator. So we can create. And the, in the image of God, he created him, male and female. Now, man there in that scripture is Adam, but male is the remembering ones. A male is a remembering one. It doesn't talk of women being the remembering ones. He said, I've created man to remember. Now, this is, this is so important. It's because of this, in the Old Testament, God told the Israelites to remember their deliverance out of Egypt at the Passover. So every Passover, which continues today, they go through the whole story of God's deliverance of Egypt out of Israel, out of Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, the miraculous. And fathers are to tell their children of the marvelous works of the Lord. So the telling the remembering, and remembering has to go from generation to generation. But what are you remembering? What are you telling to your sons? That's the critical issue. So in Psalm 78, verses 1 to 11, this is coming out of the Passion. I want to read this to you and just show you how critically important the proper remembering, the proper remembrance, keeping in remembrance, creating a memorial, remembering the miraculous of God. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded fathers to teach to their children. The testimony is the works of God, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise to tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God. It's the family, it's the male's responsibility as the teacher of the children to share the stories of the wonderful works of God in our families. Not to forget the works of God, but to keep the commandments and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn, rebellious generation, a generation whose heart is not steadfast, whose spirit is not faithful to God. When a people stop remembering, they will not keep the commandments. They will be, their hearts will not be <coughs> steadfast and they will not be faithful. Oh, this is out. I'm sorry, I started it. This is the one that comes out of the passion. Beloved ones, listen to this instruction. Open your heart to the revelation of this mystery I share with you a parable, a prophet, proverb that's hidden in what I'm saying, an intriguing riddle from the past. We've heard true stories from our father about our rich heritage. We will continue to tell our children and not hide, hide it from the rising generation, the great marvels of our God, his miracles and power that has brought us all this far. The story of Israel is a lesson in God's ways. He established decrees for Jacob and established the law in Israel and he commanded our forefathers to teach them to their children. For per perpetuity, God says, God's ways will be passed down from one generation to the next, even to those not yet born. In this way, each generation will have a living faith in the laws of life and never forget the faithful ways of God. God established a pr precept on how we are to continue and impart into our children 
the remembering of our ways, the remembering of the ways of God. Notice it is the males who are responsible to bring the remembering. But if the males are not teaching the ways of God, but they're, re they're rehearsing and they're remembering all of the trauma or all of the victories of the flesh, all of the oppression of the flesh, that is what's being imparted into that generation. So this is why I believe that men have been under such assault, why feminism has risen up so. It is to keep the voice of the male remembering the righteous ways of God, the miraculous works of God, to keep it forgotten. That we're not operating in the remembrance of the goodness of the Lord. By following the, his ways, they will break the past bondages of their fickle fathers who were stubborn, rebellious generations and whose spirits strayed from the eternal God. They refused to love him with all their hearts. Take, for example, the sons of Ephraim. So I spent some time thinking about the sons of Ephraim, which was really, really interesting. Ephraim, remember, was the second born of Joseph. And when it was time to receive the birthright, from Jacob, which was the blessing that would have gone upon the firstborn of Joseph. Jacob switched his hands and he gave the birthright of the firstborn to Ephraim. Now, I've thought a lot about Ephraim as I've been preparing this. Ephraim was raised in the courts of Pharaoh, Ephraim was superior. They had wealth beyond any wealth we would understand. They were in a position well above the other brothers of Israel, the other tribes. They were superior. And then he becomes the firstborn blessing of Jacob, Joseph. Joseph was the beloved son. It was favoritism. So here we've got Ephraim. Can you imagine how puffed up he is? He's even above his brother. And he's lived in this culture of Egypt. He wasn't born into the culture of Jacob and the stories of Jacob. He was born into the courts of Pharaoh. So here he is. And at 400 years, they had forgotten. The new Pharaoh forgot Joseph. And they would have been enslaved also. But they had an attitude of superiority. They were better than the other tribes. They expected to be the ruler of the tribe because we're, we're the offspring of Joseph, the favored son. Everyone's supposed to bow down to us as the dream of Joseph showed. Perfect example of the distortion of the prophetic. So they, though they were all equipped warriors, each with weapons, there were, there were different battles <laughs> that Ephraim was involved in. One of the challenges of Ephraim was at the time of Gideon, and Gideon, Gideon did not call them to the battle. And they were highly offended because they were such valiant warriors. So Gideon, in the wisdom of God, he stroked their flesh. Oh, I know you are such valiant warrior and warrior. And he showed them great con kindness and he honored them. And that soothed their ego. Then we move on to the time of Jephthah. And Jeph Jephthah goes to war against the Ammonites. And Ephraim's pride and his jealousy and his self-centeredness and his superiority of who he was was very offended with Jephthah for not calling them to the battle. So they, they caused a civil war and 42,000 Ephraimite soldiers were slaughtered. And the way they determined, I find this very interesting, if they were an Ephraimite soldier or not as they were fleeing is how they pronounced one word. Think about in superior culture, and how a superior culture always has a way of pronouncing words that shows that they're, they have the high language 
and not the lower language of the uneducated and the savages. So then the next thing we get is they, at the time of Rehoboam, they led the, the, rev, the revolt against the kingdom of David, and they took the 10 tribes and became the northern tribes. Now, to become the northern tribes, they had to walk away from the worship of Almighty God. And they specifically walked away from the temple because they did not want the people going to Jerusalem. And they set up idols in the northern kingdom because they were afraid that their loyalty would be taken from the northern kingdom to the southern kingdom. This is all coming out of a superior attitude. I, we should, who is Judah? How dare Judah be leading the tribe? Don't you know who we are? We are superior to everyone else. Now, in, we get into Hosea, and Hosea really nails it. Hosea tells us in Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priests. Since you've forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Now, we've taken the scripture, people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And again, I think we have that attitude that we understand. But unless we dig deep, deeper, we really don't get the depths of what God is trying to tell us. Knowledge here means the knowledge of God. This is the remembering of God. It's, it's obedience to this truth. Remember, truth is the reality of God. Truth is the reality as God sees it, not the delusion that we walk in. Reject, because you have rejected the knowledge, the truth of God. You've rejected knowing him, and you're living in a delusion, and you have despised. To reject there means to despise, to cast it away, to have nothing to do with it. You have rejected the knowledge of the Holy One of Israel. And because you've done that, I reject you as priest before me. Since you've forgotten the law of God. Now remember, male means remembrance. So here the males have forgotten. They they're oblivious to it. It's from the want of attention, a want of memory. They have not in, been relaying the wondrous works of the Lord. And they forget it because they forget God. They forget the ways of God. They forget the wondrous works of God. Basically, God says, I forget your children. Now, this is all part of Zakars, being Zakars. And we find out that Ephraim joined himself to idols. He gets drunk. He sleeps with prostitutes. He would rather be vulgar than lead a decent life. Now, what's so important about this, it says pros promiscuity wine and new wine take away understanding. Promiscuity here is being involved with other gods. And I started with saying, man took the first lie of, of Satan, and I can be his God. And in the culture of Europe, especially, even in the culture, the Hindi culture, they have God men. They became his God in the enlightenment. It was the whole pursuit of being God. And if I'm God, I can do anything. And they rejected the supernatural. This was an outright rejection of the culture, of science and reason, of the supernatural, marvelous works of God. Just as Thomas Jefferson cut out all the supernatural and all the miracles out of the Bible, it just then becomes a book that's the tree of the knowledge of good. There is no transformation that can come to a man's heart as long as his belief system, his perception of who he is, is God.
And so this is why when Paul prays in Ephesians 1, 16, 18, I pray that the Father of glory, the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, would impart to you the riches of the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation to know him, to have knowledge of him. We've got to know him through your deepening intimacy with him. I pray that the light will illuminate the eyes of your imagination, flooding you with light. Our reason has been darkened and to experience the full revelation of hope and the calling. So I want you to think of Zekai as equivalent to the memory in the seat of the soul. So what is a people group are you remembering? What is the focus? What is the church remembering? Memory creates a perception. So it starts with a memory that's a Zeka in the soul. It cre creates a perception, how we see the world, how we view things. Then that perception creates an attitude and the attitude controls everything. So if we had the memory of God, if we put ourselves in remembrance of all that he has done, this will create our perception of the world. This will, this will determine our attitude of hope, our attitude of expectation. But think back into the times where these rulers, these aristocrats in whatever culture, what are they remembering? And what are they teaching their children through their remembrance? Now, as I was studying this, I found a study that was done, I believe it was by Harvard. And they were trying to find out what caused the racial resentment of whites down in an area they call it the Black Belt. The Black Belt is where they had the most blacks post-Civil War, because this was the highest cotton producers in the nation. And that's Mississippi, Louisiana, and Arkansas. And it was a belt that went straight up. And they found that the people there really had a resentment. And the children had a resentment. Was it, and they, were, they really began to think, is this generational? So they did a study. And in the study, they are checking to see what is causing this. And they used all of these different kinds of possibilities that could be the root cause of it. At that point in time in 1865, um, there were 32% of the South was black and 4 million were enslaved. And what they had there was racial resentment. It was a form of resistance to change. Remember, we've got a perception and an attitude in racial status, quote, based on their moral feelings, the blacks violate tradition. Of course, they violate tradition because their traditions are not of Europe. So they're violating traditions. They're violating traditional American values and of individualism, self reliance, the work ethic, obedience, and discipline. Now, if you look at that, and this is with the racial resentment they found in the current generation of white men that are living in this part of our country. They are reflecting the attitudes of their forefathers, their family members, their DNA, generation and generation after the Civil War. They remembered. They remembered those attributes of the slaves that were so deeply a part of their culture because they had to resolve their cognitive dissonance. So they had to say all these things about them. And the only common denominator was that this was where they had the largest numbers of blacks post-Civil War. Those areas of the South that brought in the tractor, the racial resentment disappeared much more rapidly. And all of this, because of this racial resentment, it undermined the white economic power. Now remember, they, they, their wealth came off the backs of black men and women, of slaves. 
So when that suddenly shifted and they could not use them, of course, they had to find other ways to enslave. They enslaved through sharecropping. They enslaved through penal enslavement. This part of the world was famous for the chain gangs doing the work. And from what I read, those chain gangs, you could go for 10 to 15 years of imprisonment just for looking at a white woman the wrong way. And it also, it undermined their political powers for a season. So out of this loss of power, economics, it encouraged the violence, the racist attitudes, and it instant institutionalized the race, race, racist policy, Jim Crow laws, all of that that was instituted in the South. But it's coming out of a generational cork relief. It's in the DNA. And all of this, I believe, in such a degree, is truly coming out of the age of enlightenment. Because when man rejected God and rejected the supernatural, rejected God's Holy Spirit in the lives of men, that allowed man to become God in whatever capacity. So, I'm going to do a short um, presentation on the, I'm going to share the screen now. I'm just going to go through the verdicts of hell for those of you who have not watched it. And basically, the bottom line is, can the gates of hell prevail against the church? I'm, I'm struggling again. The reason I'm struggling is I don't want anything else to be seen except that presentation. 